Today, we are indeed continuing on in our series on money, our series on finances and our possessions. And if you're just joining us, we are in the second week of our three-week discussion on what the Bible tells us about how we should view and handle our finances as Christ followers. Um, And today, we're going to be working through one of the more famous money stories. Okay, last week, if you remember, we looked at Luke chapter 12. It's the parable of the rich fool who who had the abundant harvest. God blessed him with with much, and instead of recognizing God and his neighbor, he's like, I'm going to build a bigger barn, more stuff for me so I can provide for myself. I'm going to sit back, I can eat, drink, and be merry. And today, we're going to be looking at another story, another rich fool who is a ruler. And he too is going to make a very bad decision regarding his money and following Jesus. So last week, I had four takeaways. This week, I too have four takeaways. And the first takeaway that I have for us this morning before we even dive into our text is this, is that Jesus is good. Jesus is good. And his teachings on money are for our good. Look at the text with me. Today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. Verse 18 says, A certain ruler asked him. A certain ruler asked him. Now we don't know much about this guy. But what we do know about this guy from uh, the three Gospels that tell this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is that this guy, he's young, he is rich, and Luke tells us that he's a ruler. So very likely this, this young, rich guy, he's, an, he's a Jewish official or he's a Jewish leader with, with administrative responsibilities, probably in the local synagogue, though we don't know for certain. But what we do know is that this guy, he's an important guy, someone who was well-respected. He would have been someone who was looked up to. People would have known him. And as important people would have been back in the day, he would have been rather rich. And he comes to Jesus and he asks him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now sometimes Jesus, he's approached by the people we call the Pharisees, the religious elite of the day, the people who knew the religion, who held people accountable too much, the legalistic ones. He, he would have been approached by the Pharisees, and they would have tried to corner him. They would have tried to, to trap him with questions like these. What must one do to, to, to be saved? What must one do to inherit eternal life? And they would have had this checklist of what a right answer would have been. But that's not what's happening here. This is a legitimate question from this guy. Like, how is it going to be at the final resurrection when God comes to judge the whole world? How can I be assured that I am saved? It's a great question. A question that you and I have likely asked a time or two or three or four. How can I be saved? Jesus answers him, but you'd expect him to answer um, right away, but instead he, he gives this guy, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Why do you, why do you call me good? Do, do you even know who I am? Because if you call me good, there's only one person who's good. There is only one who is morally pure, whose decisions are good and for our good. And that's God and God alone. So if you're calling me good, you're essentially saying I'm good like God. And if his commands are good and for your good, then so are mine. The point that I'm trying to make here is that Jesus isn't trying to come in and ruin our fun when he's he's teaching about our money and our possessions. He's not trying to keep us from something good. He's trying to give us something good. His commands are for our good. If I can give you an example, Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. As a youth group, we went through what's called the drama of Scripture at our, at our uh, fall fusion retreat at the conference ground. From creation to new creation, or some of them like to call it restoration, and how we view ourselves in the story. But right away in Genesis chapter 1, we get the creation narrative, right? God creates the entire universe. 
He creates the heavens. He creates the earth. He creates the, the, the land, the seas, the stars. He creates the trees, the animals. He creates human beings like you and I in His image. He creates it all. And after He's finished creating, He takes a step back and says, this is very good. This is perfect. This is just how I wanted it to be. But then we come to Genesis chapter 3, which we call the fall. Right? The fall. Adam and Eve, God created them, and they're, they're in the Garden of Eden, and they're having this wonderful time. And God comes. He comes to Adam, and He says, Adam, you can have everything. All of this is yours. Enjoy, except for that one tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Stay away. Don't eat from it. I'm going to cone it off for you. You can have the whole orchard, just not that one tree. All right? So they live happy. They're healthy. They're naked, even. It's perfect. It's perfect. But then the serpent the devil in disguise, comes to Eve and says, God told you not to eat from any of the trees, didn't he? And Eve goes, well, no, actually, he said we can eat from all of the trees. We just can't eat from that one tree, the tree in the middle, or we'll we'll certainly die. But then the serpent says to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Like, come on. Did God really say that? You're not going to die. Stop being so dramatic, Eve. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Like, don't you want open eyes? Like, if you had the choice between open and closed eyes, you would want the open eyes, because open eyes are better, right? And then you're going to be like God. Don't you want to be like God? You see, Eve, God, he's kind of being selfish here. There, there are certain things that God wants to keep for himself because he doesn't really want to share. I know God, he seems good because he's given you the garden, but if he was actually good, he would have given you the whole garden. And he doesn't. So he's kind of being selfish here, Eve, don't you think? Don't you think? And Eve goes, hmm, yeah. Yeah. And she takes the fruit and she eats it. And then Adam comes and he too eats from the tree that they weren't supposed to. And now sin has entered into the world. Here we are today. But what I want us to see is that from the very beginning, there is this doubting of the goodness of God and that his commands are good. And the world is in the state that it's in right now because of the doubting of the goodness of God and the doubting of the goodness of his commands rejection of God starts when we doubt that he's good and his commands are for our good. But he is good and our lives, they are evidence of it. We have what we have because he is good. God is not going to save you. He's not going to choose you. He's not going to send his only one and one and only son to die for you, to come and ruin your life. He's proven already that he is for you. And his teachings are for our good, even when it comes to the hard stuff like our money and our possessions. It is ultimately for our good. And then what does he tell us about money? Our second takeaway that I have for us this morning is that our money, it will not bring fulfillment. Our money won't bring fulfillment. Look what happens in the story. Jesus continues to answer this ruler. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke 18, verse 20 says, You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Okay, this is not the response that we expect to hear from Jesus. When someone approaches an evangelist, we hope to hear not that, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do the law. Just keep the law perfectly. No, what we hope to hear, what we hope to hear, and sometimes we don't, but what we hope to hear is you're saved by faith. Grace. But we don't get that from Jesus. What you expect to hear from Jesus is repent, believe in me, come follow me, put your faith in me, but instead we get, do the law. Actually, just do the last five of the Ten Commandments. And then we're sitting here like Jesus. That's, 
It sounds like you're telling this guy that you can be saved through works. You can be saved by doing good. You can somehow, some way, earn your salvation. That's not what I was taught in catechism. That's not what I was taught in church or school or youth group or family worship. What's, what's going on here? But here's the problem. God, He has given us His perfect law. And He says to all of us that we must be holy as the Heavenly Father is holy. We must be perfect like the Heavenly Father is perfect. So here's the law, God says. Keep it. Ready, set, go, do. But we can't. We can't. We just talked about sin. Sin is in the world. Everything that we do is tainted by sin. But Pastor Ryan, I can, I can keep the law better than other people. It doesn't matter. Perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the problem we now have is we're condemned. We're condemned because we fail to keep the law perfectly. And the law says eternal condemnation for those who cannot keep the law. The outlook is very bad for us. It's very bleak. So what we need is someone. Someone who is able to keep the law perfectly on our behalf. Someone who is willing to give up their righteousness so that one day we can stand before God, not clothed in our unrighteousness, but stand before God in their righteousness. I wonder who that could be. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who is our Lord. So salvation is through grace. It's through faith. That's how we access it. Jesus came in perfect grace to die on the cross for us. And through the gift of faith, we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that faith is in the works of not of our own, but in the works of Jesus Christ. And that is the best news ever. Because that means when the enemy, the devil, comes up to you and says, you're not good enough, we can say, I know. I absolutely know that. But Jesus is. You don't, you don't deserve heaven. <laughs> You're right. But Jesus does. You're not righteous. Actually, I am. Not because of anything I've done, certainly not, but because of Jesus. And when God sees me, He sees His one and only Son. So your ability to keep the law, that's not the issue. There's no trying to be a good Christian. There's no trying to earn your way into heaven. There is only Jesus. There is only Jesus. So Jesus here, He's kind of setting this ruler up. He's kind of setting him up. This ruler comes to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, don't commit adultery. Don't lie, don't murder, don't steal. Honor your mom, honor your dad. The back end of the Ten Commandments that have to do with the relationship that people have with one another. But then the guy, the ruler, says to Jesus, verse 21, that all of these things I've kept since I was a boy. I've kept all of these things. Like even from when I was a baby, I've never murdered anybody. I don't remember committing adultery. I haven't lied, I haven't stolen. I, my parents, they know how much I love them. I get them a gift every Mother and Father's Day. I've always done these things. But what's he claiming here? I'm righteous. I'm perfect. I'm holy. I, I deserve this. I have earned it. If the, if the Ten Commandments were a checklist, I would have checked off on every single one of them. But when Jesus heard this, verse 22, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. In the original language here, the word order is everything. All of it. Get rid of it. Sell it. Give it to the poor. Then come and follow me. There's this emphasis on everything. All of it. Sell it. Give it to the poor. You're going to have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Why does Jesus give this command? What is he after? Why is he telling this to this particular guy at this particular time? If we go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. God is going to give Moses, the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. And it says, And God spoke all of these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Okay, so I've shown you grace. I have saved you. And now I'm going to give you my command. Command number one. 
you shall have no other gods before me. So in your allegiances, in the list of those who uh, you're going to follow and where you find your meaning and your purpose and your joy, when all of these other things, they kind of crowd in and you have to say yes or no to them, if they threaten my primary place in your heart, then they need to go. They got to go. You shall have no other gods before me. So you have this ruler. He's coming to Jesus. I've done all of these things. I'm righteous. Look at how amazing I am. I earn this. I, I deserve this. And Jesus is like, oh, really? Okay. Let's just see how you do with the first one. Go sell everything. Everything you own, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me because it's either me, and remember I'm good, right? I'm good like God is good. In fact, I, I am God. So you, it's either me and then everything else under it, or it's your money and your possessions and everything, including me, under it. So choose. What's it going to be? What are you going to do with the very first commandment? What is going to be the primary place in your heart? His answer, verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. The challenge with money is it very easily becomes the source of our joy instead of God. The thing about money is it promises to keep us safe so that we feel warm and cozy and secure when we have it. Like we buy that, that new thing. We buy that new thing and we get this, this brief sense of joy and contentment and satisfaction. And that, that happiness and contentment and satisfaction can actually dupe us into thinking that these, this money and these possessions can, can actually be an answer to all of life's problems. Like if I just had enough money, if I, just, if I just had the right investments, if I just had the right home, if I just had the right car, if I just had whatever. Remember last week, if I just had bigger barns, then I could store up all of these things and I'd be able to provide for myself and I'd be satisfied, I'd be happy, and I wouldn't need anything else, including God. We might not say it. We might not think it but our actions sometimes can prove otherwise. It wants to be the master in your life, and it sells itself. The whole world, it trusts, it believes that money is the master, and it can deliver when we need it the most. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, to not set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather set your hopes on the certainty of God. But it's so easy to set our hopes on the uncertainty of our riches and to believe that it's going to come through and deliver when we need it the most. If I can be really practical here for a moment, it, to me it looks like this. Say you're on social media. You name whatever social media, Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, MySpace, whatever, I don't know. You're on social media and you're scrolling and then you see these ads come up and these ads, they're tailor-made to you because they're watching you. You know that, right? <laughs> they're watching you. And, and say you're in bed and you see this ad and, and it's for the new iPhone. What iPhone are we on? 16? You see this new ad for the 16. And it's telling you that you can take a picture and you can edit it. And that edited picture comes to life. So you got to have the 16. So I'm in bed. It's like, Keziah, I have a 13. Did you know that that's three less? I got to have the I got to have the 16. So please cuz I can I please 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 cuz I please can I get the 16 please look what it can do and she goes finally yes you can have the 16 so I go and I get the 16 and it's awesome it's you get this brief sense of joy and happiness and contentment and satisfaction like look I can take the picture and I can edit it and it does come to life boom there it is it's really cool and then it lasts for a short period of time because and after a, 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 again this brief moment of time you start to think well it can't do everything. And then the fall comes. And then the 17 comes out. And the 17 can walk on its own. <laughs> so you got to get the 17. 
So you go and you get the 17, and then, but then again, the same thing happens, and then the next fall, the 18 comes out, and the 18, you can reach God directly with the 18. So it's like, I got to get the 18, and over and over and over again it goes, and the reason we keep doing it is this brief sense of happiness that we receive when we get this new product. Like if I just keep doing it enough, then maybe I will finally feel fulfilled. I will have bought the right product. I would have enough stuff to settle in my heart this tension and it will give me peace and contentment and I'll finally be able to say that I'm at rest. Walmart tells us to save money, live better. I want a better life and Walmart's going to give it to me. (laughs) Have you ever been to a Walmart? Like, are you kidding me? (laughs) But this is the sales pitch. So you understand why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 to not set your hopes in the uncertainty of our riches because they will never fulfill you. You're looking for contentment with, with money and you go to it over and over and over again and our houses are big and they're filled with all of this stuff and our bank accounts are large, but at the end of the day, we are still horribly empty and sad. But Jesus isn't like this. The Apostle Paul, the same guy who wrote First Timothy, wrote this letter to the Philippians. And Paul, at this point, he's received a financial gift from the church in Philippi, and he writes in in Philippians, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Like, yeah, there were some barriers, no worries, I get it. But I need to be very clear about something. I need you to know something. I know you've given me this financial gift, but I want you to know that, verse 11, that I am not saying this because I am in need. I know I was in prison, I know I had no food, food, but I wasn't in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Would we not love to know how to be content with whatever the circumstances, whether good or bad, rich or poor? Verse 12, I know that what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then here's the verse that we all know and love. The verse that we put on our t-shirts. We slap on stickers so we can put it on our water bottles. We put it on our fridge. We put it on signs so we can hang up in the home. We quote it before we go out and tackle one another on the football field. I can do all things all things through him who gives me strength. All things through Christ who gives me strength. What kind of things? Well, to be rich or to be poor, to have much or to have little, to be hungry or to be well-fed, to win or to lose, it ultimately doesn't matter. Why? Because we have Jesus. And he's enough. So you want the secret to contentment? Turn away from the riches. Sink into Jesus. And all of the expectations that you have with your riches, turn away from them and say, no matter what happens to me, God, no matter what you provide, I'm going to have treasure in heaven, which is you. It's in you. It's in Jesus that we find our lasting fulfillment. Takeaway number three. We're going to go through takeaway number three and four pretty quickly here. But takeaway number three, I have no other way of summarizing these these next few verses other than it takes a miracle. It takes a miracle for a rich person like you and I to enter into the kingdom of God. Starting in verse 24, it says, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. A camel going through the eye of a needle, it seems impossible. In fact, it is impossible. So people throughout time, they've tried to come up with their own little interpretations to make it seem not so impossible. Right? Perhaps you've heard of some of these these interpretations. But the problem is 
that this, this illustration, as crazy as it sounds, is meant to demonstrate, to illustrate the impossibility of it. A camel is huge. It's like a moose, if not bigger. Okay? The eye of the needle is small. Big things, okay? Do not go through little things. But broad is the, is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to life. It's impossible. It's impossible. So verse 26, those who heard this, they asked, and who can be saved? Who then can be saved? They asked this question because they just heard Jesus say that a rich person cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But aren't the riches a sign of God's blessing? So if they can't get in, what about us? Verse 27 says, Jesus replied, what is impossible with man? Rich people like you and I is possible with God. In other words, it takes a miracle. It takes a miracle because wealth makes us proud. It makes us rely on money and leaves no room for God. It makes us big when only the humble and the weak inherit the kingdom. It takes a miracle, the miracle of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And then the final takeaway that I have for us this morning is that you can't outgive him. You can't outgive God. Peter, he sees this young rich ruler and he's sad and he's, he's walking off and, and Jesus says what's impossible with man is certainly possible with God. And then I love Peter. This kind of makes me laugh. Verse 28, he speaks up. He says, hey, we've left all we had to follow you. Okay, we've done the exact opposite of this guy. So what happens with us? We've sacrificed everything. We've, we've given up our jobs. We've given up our homes. We've left our wives. We've left our families. What about us, the people who have sacrificed everything? Verse 29 says, Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. You cannot outgive God. There is not a single sacrifice that you can make on this side of heaven for the kingdom of God that will not be repaid to you many times over in this life and in the life to come. And this is where the prosperity guys get up and are like, yes, well done. Preach it. This is how we're going to get rich. You give to God your money and then he owes you. And he's going to give you more. Absolutely not. Wrong idea. This passage is saying something very differently. How is God going to provide for you many times over? Where is this going to come from? It's not in luxury items. Good grief. That's our worldly way of thinking. God, he was a man. Jesus, he was a man of sorrows. He didn't even have a home. His disciples, minus John, they were all killed. That's not luxurious. But a life, money, possessions, all of it, sacrificed for the kingdom of God is repaid in peace and rest and assurance and fellowship within the body and all of these promises that we read about in Scripture. And it's a peace and it's a rest and it's assurance and it's all of these things that come from following the Lord and knowing that something far greater than we could ever imagine is coming for you and for me. The sad rich ruler, he couldn't separate himself from a life of luxury. And in many ways, we find ourselves in the same boat. We're much like him. We love our stuff. We love our bank accounts. But what must I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus? Good teacher. Go, sell your stuff. Give to the poor. You're going to have treasure in, in heaven. Just come and, and follow me. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> God, that's hard. I'm not sure I can do that perfectly. And Jesus is like, I know. I know, but if only, if only there was someone, someone who was standing right in front of you, someone who was both fully God and fully man, someone who would go and take your place on the cross and die for your sins. In the moments where we, we fail 
and desire more money and desire more things and we neglect God and we neglect our neighbor if only there was a Savior. The, the young, rich ruler, he failed to recognize who it was that was standing before him. Jesus, who is good like God, who is God, would go one day and take, or he has, take our place on that cross to die the death that we deserve. Again, in the moments where we desire more stuff and, and desire bigger bank accounts and all of these things, in the moments we fall short. And now this certainly doesn't mean that we should go on crucifying the Lord so that we can have cushy retirements and big bank accounts and all this new stuff. But in the moments, again, where we do fall short, even when we don't know we're doing it, all of this should lead us into thanksgiving for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Praise be to God, who is our hope and who is our salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Again, for the word that you provide for us this morning. Again, we look at the, the difficult, difficult theme of money. Another difficult text for us to hear, Lord. It's hard. Because we are sinful, and we do turn to our money and our possessions way too often. Lord, we know that. You know that. So Lord, all of this, though we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, some of us might be feeling a little convicted right now. I know I am. By your Spirit, may we live out a life that is more and more like Jesus. But again, in the moments where we fail, we, we fall short of what you desire for us. We fall short of your good and perfect law and your, and your law that is, that is meant for our good, including our finances and our possessions. May we give thanks to you. May this lead us into a greater life of praise and thanksgiving for what you have done for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.